Hi there, it's Grandma. And it's time for another chapter of Little House in the Big Woods. Wait, there we go. And this time it's a chapter about Christmas. So it's Christmas in the Big Woods. And here's the first, first picture of kids throwing snowballs at each other. That looks like fun. Christmas was coming. The little log house was almost buried in snow. Great drifts were banked against the walls and windows, and in the morning when Pa opened the door, there was a wall of snow as high as Laura's head. Pa took the shovel and shoveled it away, and then he shoveled a path to the barn where the horses and cows were snug and warm in their stalls. The days were clear and bright. Laura and Mary stood on chairs by the window, and they looked out across the glittering snow at the glittering trees. Snow was piled all along their bare, dark branches, and it sparkled in the sunshine. Icicles hung from the eaves of the house to the snowbanks, great icicles as large as the top of Laura's arm. They were like glass and full of sharp lights. Pa's breath hung in the air like smoke when he came along the path from the barn. He breathed it out in clouds, and it froze in white frost on his mustache and beard. When he came in, stamping the snow from his boots and caught up Laura in a big bear's hug against his big cold coat, his mustache was beaded with little drops of melting frost. Every night he was busy, working on a large piece of board and two small pieces. He whittled them with his knife and he rubbed them with sandpaper and against the palm of his hand, and when Laura touched them they were as soft and smooth as silk. Then, with his sharp jackknife, he worked at them, cutting the edges of one large one into two little peaks and towers with a large star carved on the tallest point. Then he cut little holes through the woods. He cut the holes in shape of windows and little stars and crescent moons and circles. And all around them he carved tiny leaves and flowers and birds. On one of these little boards, he shaped a lovely curve, and round its edges he carved leaves and flowers and stars, and, it, and through it he cut crescent moons and curlicues. All around the edges of the smallest board, he carved a lovely tiny flowering vine. He made the tiniest sh shavings, cutting very slowly and carefully, making whatever he thought would be pretty. And at last he had the pieces finished, and one night he fitted them together. When this is done, with a large piece, he s w the large piece was a beautifully carved back for a smooth little shelf across the middle. The large star was at the top of it, and the curved piece supported the piece underneath, and it was carved beautifully too, and a little vine ran all around the edge of the shelf. Pa made this bracket for a Christmas present for Ma. He hung it carefully against the log wall between the windows, and Ma stood her little china woman on the shelf. The little china woman had on a china bonnet on her head, and her china curls hung against her china neck. Her china dress was laced across the front, and she wore a pale pink china apron and little gilt china shoes. She was beautiful, standing on the shelf with the flowers and the leaves and birds and moon all carved around her and the large star at the very top. Ma was busy all day long, cooking good things for Christmas. She baked salt rising bread and Ryan engine bread and Swedish crackers and a huge pan of baked beans with salt pork and molasses. She baked vinegar pies and dried apple pies and filled a big jar with cookies, and she let Laura and Mary lick the cake spoon. One morning she boiled molasses and sugar together until they made a, sh a thick syrup, and Pa brought in two pans of queen, clean white snow from the outdoors. Laura and Mary each had a pan, and Pa and Ma showed them how to pour the dark syrup in little streams onto the snow. They made little circles and curlicues and squiggledy things, and these hardened at once, and they were candy. Laura and Mary might eat one piece each, but the rest was saved for Christmas Day. 
all this was done because Aunt Eliza and Uncle Peter and the cousins, Peter and Alice and Ella, were coming to spend Christmas. The day before Christmas Day came, Laura and Mary heard the gay ringing of sleigh bells growing louder every moment, and the big bobsled came out of the woods and drove up to the gate. Aunt Eliza and Uncle Peter and the cousins were in it, all covered up under blankets and robes and buffalo skins. They were wrapped in so many coats and mufflers and veils and shawls that they looked like big shapeless bundles. When they all came in, the little house was full and running over. Black Susan ran out and hid in the barn, but Jack leapt in circles through the snow, barking as though he would never stop. Now there were cousins to play with. As soon as Aunt Eliza had unwrapped them, Peter and Alice and Ella and Laura and Mary began to run and shout. At last, Aunt Eliza told them to be quiet, and Alice said, I'll tell you what, Stu, let's go make pictures. So Alice said they must go outdoors to do it, and Ma thought it was too cold for Laura to play outside. But when she saw how disappointed Laura was, she said she might go after all for a little while. She put on Laura's coat and mittens and a warm cape around the hood and wrapped her muffler around her neck and let her go. Laura had never had so much fun. All morning she played outdoors in the snow with Alice and Ella and Peter and Mary making pictures. The way they did it was this. Each one by themselves climbed up on a stump and then all at once holding their arms at wide, fell off the stump and into the soft, deep snow. They fell flat on their faces when they tried to get up without spoiling the marks they made with if then they tried to get up without spoiling the marks they made when they fell. If they did it well, there in the in the snow were five holes, shaped exactly like four little girls and a boy, arms and legs and all. They called these pictures. Up oh, and here they are. That looks like fun. We do that only when we fall backwards, don't we? To make snow angels. They played so hard all day that when night came, they were too excited to sleep. But they must sleep where Santa Claus would not come. So they hung their stockings by the fireplace and said their prayers and went to bed. Alice and Ella and Mary and Laura all in one big bed on the floor. Peter had the trundle bed. Aunt Eliza and Uncle Peter were going to sleep in the big bed, and another bed was made on the attic floor for Pa and Ma. The buffalo robes and all of the blankets had been brought in from Uncle Peter's sled, so there were enough covers for everybody. Pa and Ma and Aunt Eliza and Uncle Peter sat by the fire and t talking, and just as Laura was drifting off to sleep, she heard Uncle Peter say, Eliza had a narrow squeak the other day while I was away at Lake City. You know Prince, that big dog of mine? Laura was wide awake at once. She always liked to hear about dogs. She lay as still as a mouse and looked at the firelight flickering on the log walls and listened to Uncle Peter. There she is. She's supposed to be sleeping, but she's listening to Uncle Peter's story. Well, Uncle Peter said, early in the morning, Eliza went to the spring to get a pail of water, and Prince was following her. She got to the edge of the ravine where the path goes down to the spring, and all of a sudden, Prince set his teeth in the back of her skirt and pulled. You know what a big dog he is. Eliza scolded him, but he would not let go, and he's so big and strong, she couldn't get away from him. He kept backing and pulling until he tore a piece out of her skirt. It was my blue print. Aunt Eliza said to Ma. Oh, dear me, said Ma. He tore a big piece right out of the back of it, Aunt Eliza said. I was so mad I could have whipped him for it, but he growled at me. Prince growled at you, said Ma. Yes, said Aunt Eliza. And then she started on towards the spring, Peter, Uncle Peter went on, but Prince jumped in the path ahead of her and snarled at her. He paid no attention to her talking and scolding. He just kept showing her teeth and snarling and all. When she tried to get past him, he kept in front of her and snapped at her, and that scared her. Well, I think it would, said Ma. He was so savage, I thought he was going to bite me, said Aunt Eliza. I, th I believe he would have. I've never heard of such things, said Ma. What on earth did you do? Well, I turned right around and went back to the house where the children were, said Aunt Eliza, and slammed the door. 
Now, of course, P Prince was savage with strangers, said Uncle Peter, but he was always kind to Eliza and the children, and I felt perfectly safe to leave them with him. Eliza couldn't stand, understand it at all. After she got into the house, he kept pacing around it and growling, and every time she started to open the door, he jumped at her and snarled. Had he gone mad, said Mom? That's what I thought said Aunt Eliza. I didn't know what to do. There I was, shut up in the house with the children, not daring to go out, and we didn't have any water. I couldn't even get any snow to melt. Every time I opened the door so much as a crack, Prince acted like he would tear me to pieces. Oh, how long did this go on, said Pa. All day till late in the afternoon, said Aunt Eliza. Peter had taken the gun or I would have shot him. A long late in the afternoon, Uncle Peter said, he got quiet and he lay down in front of the door. Aunt Eliza thought she, he was asleep and she made her mind up to try to slip past him and get to the spring for some water. So she opened the door very quietly, but of course he woke up right, right away. And he saw she had the water pail in her hand and he got up and he walked ahead of her to the spring just the same as usual. And there, all around the spring in the snow, were the fresh tracks of a panther. The tracks were as big as my hand, said Aunt Eliza. Yes, Uncle Peter said. He was a big fellow. His tracks were the biggest I'd ever seen. He would he would have got Eliza for sure if, pa, if Prince had let her go to the spring that morning. I saw the tracks. He had been lying up in that big oak over the spring waiting for some animal to come down here for water. Undoubtedly, he would have dropped down on her. Night was coming on, and she saw the tracks, so she didn't waste any time getting back to the house with her pail of water. Prince followed close behind her, looking back into the ravine now and then. I took him in, into the house with me, said Aunt Eliza, and we all stayed inside until Peter came home. Did you get him? Pa asked Uncle Peter. No, Uncle Peter said. I took my gun out and hunted all around the place, but I couldn't find him. I did see some more of his, his tracks. He'd gone on farth farther into the, on north, farther into the big woods. Alice and Ella and Mary were all wide awake now, and Laura put her head under the covers and whispered to Alice, My, weren't you scared? Alice whispered back that she was scared, but Ella was scareder. And Ella whispered that she was not, not any such thing. Well, anyway, you're the one who made more fuss about being thirsty, said Alice. They lay there whispering about it until Ma said, Charles, those children will never get to sleep unless you play for them. So Pa got down his fiddle. The room was still and warm and full with firelight. Ma's shadow and Aunt Eliza's and Uncle Peter's were big and quivering on the walls in the flickering, flickering firelight, and Pa's fiddle sang merrily to itself. It sang Money Dusk and the Red Heifer and the Devil's Dream and Arkansas Traveler. Laura went to sleep while Pa and the fiddle were both singing, My darling Nellie Gray, they have taken you away, and I'll never see my darling any more. In the morning, they woke up almost at the same moment. They all looked at their stockings, and something was in them. Santa Claus had been there. Alice and Ella and Laura in their red flannel nightgowns, and Peter in his red flannel nightshirt went all running around to see what he had brought. In each stocking there was a pair of bright red mittens and a long flat stick of pepper, of red and white peppermint striped candy, all beautifully notched along each side. They were so happy they could hardly speak at first. They looked with shining eyes at these lovely Christmas presents, but Laura was the happiest of all. Laura had a rag doll. She was a beautiful doll. She had a face of white cloth with black button eyes. A black pencil had made her eyebrows, and her cheeks and her mouth were red with the ink made from pokeberries. Her hair was black yarn that had been knit and raveled so that it was curly. She had little flannel stock, red flannel stockings and little black cloth for gaiters for shoes, and her dress was a pity pink and blue calico. And here's one of them with the boop, 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 boop. ah, there we go, with the new mittens. It's one of the cousins, and there is Laura with her new doll. She was so beautiful that Laura could not say a word. 
She just held her tight and forgot everything else. She did not know that everyone else was looking at her until Aunt Eliza said, Did you ever see such big eyes? The other girls were not jealous because Laura had mittens and candy and a doll, because Laura was the littlest girl, except for baby Carrie and Aunt Eliza's little baby Dolly Varden. The babies were too small for dolls. They were so small they did not know about Santa Claus. They just put their fingers in their mouths and wiggled because of all the excitement. Laura sat down on the edge of the bed and held her doll. She loved the red mittens and she loved the candy, but she loved her red doll best of all. She named her Charlotte. Then they all looked at each other's mittens and tried on their own, and Peter Big a bit a big piece out of his stick of candy. But Laura and Alice and Ella and Mary just licked theirs to make it last longer. Well, well, Uncle Peter said, isn't there even one stocking with nothing but a switch in it? My, have you all been such good children? But they didn't believe that Santa Claus could really give them anything, nothing, nothing but a switch. Maybe that happened to some children, but couldn't happen to them. It was so hard to be good all the time, every day for a whole year. Oh, you mustn't tease the children, Peter, said Aunt Eliza. Ma said, Laura, aren't you going to let the other girls hold your doll? That meant, Laura, you must not be so selfish. So Laura let Mary take the beautiful doll, and then Alice held her for a minute, and then Ella, and they smoothed the pretty dress and admired the red flannel stockings and the gaiters and the curly woolen hair. But Laura was glad when at last Charlotte was safe in her arms again. Pa and Uncle Peter each had a pair of new warm mittens, knit in little squares of red and white. Ma and Aunt Eliza had made them. Aunt Eliza had brought Ma a large rat apple stuck full of cloves. How good it smelled! And it would not spoil either, for so many cloves would keep it sound and sweet. Ma gave Aunt Eliza a little needle book she made, with bits of silk for covers and soft white flannel leaves into which to stick the needles. The flannel would help keep the needles from rusting. And they all admired Ma's beautiful new bracket, and Aunt Eliza said Uncle Peter had made one for her, of course, with a different carving. Santa Claus had not given them anything at all. Santa Claus did not give grown people per presents because it was not because they had not been good. Pa and Ma were good. It was because they were grown up, and grown ups must give each other people presents. Grown ups must give each other presents. Then all the presents were laid away for a little while. Pa went out, Peter went out with Pa and Uncle Peter to do the chores, and Ellis, Alice and Ella helped Aunt Eliza make the beds, and Laura and Mary set the table, and Ma got breakfast. For breakfast there were pancakes, and Ma made a pancake man for each of the children. She called it each one in turn to bring it, bring their plate, and each could stand by the stove and watch while each spoonful of batter Ma put on the arms and legs and the head. It was exciting to watch her turn the whole little man over quickly and carefully on a hot griddle. When it was done, she put it smoking hot on the plate. Peter ate the head off his man right away, but Laura and Mary and Ella, uh, Laura and Mary and Alice and Ella ate theirs slowly in little bits, first the arms and legs, and then the middle, saving the head for last. Today the weather was so cold that they could not play outdoors, but there were new mittens to admire and candy to lick, and they all sat on the floor to, together and looked at the pictures in their picture Bible, and all of the pictures of kinds of birds and animals in Pa's big green book. Laura kept Charlotte on her in her arms the whole time. Then there was Christmas dinner. Alice and Ella and Peter and Mary and Laura did not say a word at table, for they knew that children should be seen and not heard, but they did not need to ask for second helpings. Ma and Aunt Eliza kept their plates full and let them eat all the good things they could hold. Christmas comes but once a year, said Aunt Eliza. Dinner was early because Aunt Eliza and Uncle Peter and the cousins had such a long way to go home. Best the horses can do, Uncle Peter said, we'll hardly have make it home before dark. As soon as they had eaten dinner, Uncle Peter and Pa put the sh took, 
went to put the horses to the sled while Ma and Aunt Eliza wrapped up the cousins. They pulled heavy woolen stockings over the woolen stockings and shoes they were already wearing. And they put on mittens and coats and warm hoods and shawls. And there's, uh, there's a picture of them getting all dressed so they can go back out in the cold. And Laura with her doll. They wrapped mufflers around their necks and thick woolen veils over their faces. Ma slipped piping hot baked potatoes into their pockets to keep their fingers warm, and Aunt Eliza's flat irons were hot on the stove, ready to put at their feet in the sled. The blankets and the quilts and the buffalo robes were warmed, too. So they all got into the big bobsled, cozy and warm, and Pa tucked the last robe in well around them. Goodbye, goodbye, they called, and off they went, the horses trotting gaily and the sleigh bells ringing. In just a while, the merry sound of the bells was gone and Christmas was over, but what a happy Christmas it had been. All right, the next chapter is called Sundays, so we'll read that another day. All right, bye now.